Before we get started changing action maps, I think there are a few things worth knowing. First, if you missed my earlier video on Unity's new input system, go check that out. This video is going to build on what that video explored. We're not going to do a whole lot of backtracking on that content. Also, I've seen a few videos and frankly more written posts talking about switching action maps. And while it's not complicated, and you might even argue that it's trivial to switch action maps, the solutions that I've seen so far, I don't think will scale very well. And by that, I mean, if you stick it in a real game with several objects that are responding to input, you need to have a system to handle the switching without causing errors. And creating that system? Well, that's what this video is going to be all about, or at least creating the best system that I've come up with so far. If you've created a better system than what I have, or you've seen a better system, share it and leave a comment down below. I'd love to see it. So onto the point of this video, switching action maps. Why would we do that? Well, action maps define a series of actions that can be contextual. For example, a third person controller might use one action map, driving a vehicle might use another, and that using the UI might use yet another. With the new input system, it's easy to control which set of actions, i.e. action map, is active and being used by a player. You can easily toggle off your player's motion while navigating the UI or preventing a player from casting a spell while riding a horse or whatever your game might need. With the new input system, you have more control and the code that gives you that control, while more abstract, is generally far cleaner than it would be with an old input system. But first we have a problem to fix. As I mentioned in the last video, the simplest implementation of the new input system has each object create an instance of an input action asset. This works great if there's only one object that is reacting to the player input. But if there's more than one object listening to input, say UI, sound effects, vehicles, this gets messy, exponentially more so if you intend on switching action maps as all those objects will need to know which action map is currently in use. Forget one object and something strange or goofy might start happening like shooting sound effects while driving a tractor. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure what the best solution for this is. Maybe there's some clever programming pattern, but for now, my solution is to fall back and use an input manager. Now, why you might ask? Well, this allows a single static instance of the input action asset to be created and accessed by any other class that needs to be aware of player input. Now, I don't love this dependence on a manager script, but I think it's far tidier than trying to keep a bunch of scripts in the scene up to date with an active action map. The input manager's main role is to be in charge of enabling and disabling action maps. And when an action map is disabled, it won't invoke events. So scripts that are subscribed to those events will simply have nothing to respond to. Now, if we take a look at the input manager itself, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It has a public static instance of the input action asset and an action that will get called when the action map is changed. The real magic happens in the toggle action map function. This function is public and static and will be called by scripts that need to toggle the action map. Inside this function, we first check to see if the requested action map is already enabled. If it is, we don't need to do anything. However, if it's not active, we toggle off all action maps by calling it disable on the input action asset itself. This has the same effect as calling disable on each and every action in the action map, which is a pretty handy shortcut. Next, we invoke the action map changed event. This allows things like the UI to be aware of changes and give the player a visual indication of the change. This could also be used to toggle cameras or sound effects depending on the action map activated. Now, of course, this step is optional, but I think will generally prove to be pretty useful in most games. The last step is to enable the desired action map. And with that, we now have the ability to change the global action map. So say what you will about the new input system, but that's mighty clean. So let's take a look at a concrete example of implementing this system. For my use case, the player can change between a normal third person controller and driving a very janky tractor, the jank being in my control code, not the tractor itself. The change to controlling the tractor happens when the player walks near the tractor and enters a trigger surrounding the tractor. The player can then exit the tractor by pressing the escape key or the north button on a gamepad. The setup of the tractor action map is pretty simple, while the third person controller has more options. In the tractor controller class, there are a handful of movement related variables. The most important is the input action variable that will hold a reference to the movement action that is on the tractor action. We get a reference to this input action in the onEnable function by referencing the static instance of the input action asset in the input manager class, then going through the tractor action map and lastly to the movement action itself. Also in the on enable, we subscribe the exit tractor function to the exit action. This will allow the player to press a button and switch back to the third person controller. Then 
In the onDisable function, we unsubscribe to prevent any redundancy of calls or errors in the case of the object being turned off or destroyed. Inside the exit tractor function, we call the public static function toggle action map on the input manager to change the active map to the player action map. Likewise, in the onTriggerEnter function, the toggle action map function is called to activate the tractor action map. All in all, the implementation of this is actually pretty simple. And of course, the exact implementation of how and when action maps are changed depends on your game. But the basic structure is easy to use and I think easily adaptable to most games. Now, before we finish up, I have a few final thoughts on changing action maps. Now, with the system that I presented, I don't love that any class in the game can switch the active action map. But honestly, I'm not sure how to get around that in a clean and tidy way. The input manager could easily have some filters in the toggle action map function, but that will absolutely depend on the implementation and the needs of your game. You might also be able to come up with some wrapper class that wraps the input action asset and only gives access to the features, which I would imagine is likely just the events, that you want to have widely available. You could also potentially skip the input manager and create some sort of abstract input receiver class that all objects that react to input inherit from. This could ensure that all objects are aware of which action map is active, but I think you'd quickly get into a mess of multiple inheritance and unintended consequences. Also, with the system that I've presented, I think it's worth noting that this approach doesn't directly work for having multiple players, since there is only one instance of the input action asset, and each player would require a separate instance. So there would need to be some additional cleverness and such. But that, that I'll save for another tutorial. Maybe. Until next time, happy game designing.